uh, go through a few housekeeping things first. Um, so as I said, feel free to say hello in the chat box. Let us know where you're joining from today. Um, as you can see on the slide, there is live interpretation in uh, French and Spanish available uh, today. Uh, so you can access this by clicking on the globe uh, icon at the bottom of your screen uh, and also uh, invitation for our speakers and myself uh, to speak uh, slowly and clearly so that uh, interpreters can um, can do live translation and thank you uh, to these people. Uh, we will have a bit of time towards the end of the webinar for Q&A. Uh, so you also have a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Please post your questions uh, in there throughout the webinar. Um, feel free to uh, share some of the perspective from our speakers on social media as well throughout the webinar. Uh, you can use the hashtag IPCC um, as the main thing we're going to be talking about. Uh, and the webinar is also being recorded uh, to let you know. Uh, so, uh, before I introduce uh, our speakers and what we're going to go through today, uh, I just want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge the space we find ourselves in. Uh, so, obviously, in the past week, we've uh, seen the release of the latest IPCC report uh, with not so surprising but still harrowing news uh, of the scale of the climate crisis. Uh, we'll be shortly unpacking all of this. Uh, and we also find ourselves in the context of a war being launched on Ukraine. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to express our solidarity to the people of Ukraine and also to acknowledge, recognize and send solidarity to other communities across the globe who have and continue to be under attack and who have been and continue to be impacted by war, conflict, violence, injustice and oppression. Uh, so we'll be talking about these topics that are quite heavily and emotionally charged throughout the webinar. So please do whatever you can do to be kind and gentle to yourselves throughout the, the whole hour and a half. So uh, in the webinar, uh, we will first uh, be talking a little bit about this context we find ourselves in uh, and what is happening in Ukraine uh, with Svetlana Romanko. Um, and we will then uh, go into unpacking a little bit the findings of the IPCC report, but also what it means for our movements and our climate justice demands. We'll be doing that with Professor Wolfgang Kramer and Asad Weyman. And then we will uh, hear some much needed perspectives on hope and on people power from activists, organizers and community leaders uh, Tasnim Esop, Amanda Costa, and Francisco Javier Pera Manzanares. Uh, and then we'll finish with a little bit of time for Q&A. So that's a whole program. Uh, and without further ado, I will give the floor to uh, Svetlana. Uh, so Svetlana Romanko is an environmental lawyer and Ukrainian climate justice activist green strategist and a campaign manager, passionate about climate justice, ending fossil fuels, green finance, and a green inclusive economy. Uh, Svetlana, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Liz, and I am very pleased to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today with you. And I will try to give you as much uh, updated uh, information on Ukraine as I do have. and. We'll speak today about um, justice, not only climate justice, and we will speak a lot about people power, which fits us, fits us with enormous energy, even if in the toughest, very, very tough situations, we still are always able to find an inner resources. So as you know, our country, our Ukraine is at war. So our people are massively dying on the front lines. And this is, to our strictest conven convention, it's a fossil fuel financed war by Russia, the largest country in the world by landmass, with 60% of the economy based on fossil fuel exploration and trade. 
I would like slightly to go back into prerequisites that cost this in just extraordinary, unimaginable uh, war, which we never have expected to witness uh, in 21st century, of course. But it seems like, yes, this invasion confronts Europe with the darkest hours and confronts the world with a grimmer future. But this is exactly these times that require us to stand up and stand firm and stand united and take bold actions against the forces who willingly threaten our collective existence. Uh, that's the highest time to restore justice, I would say. And this is at times when we can witness ourselves. The justice is very, very substantial definition, which we uh, and uh, which we can even think, yeah, it's not material, but we can see some material prerequisites and material outputs of what justice is. So just recognizing that the war uh, in Russia, uh, the war by Russia against Ukraine is a war Ukraine, uh, against Ukrainian sovereignty and independence. And it's also a grave violation of human rights, international law and the global peace. Why that has, this has happened in the heart of Europe and uh, with the policy developments where we are? First of all, I believe that the governments and foreign fossil fuel companies fed and expressed a long-term blind, blind tolerance to Russia based on its fossil fuel richest economy status quo, the extensive consumption and dependence of its unlimited fossil fuel reserves in the European Union and the close arms of partnership with foreign fossil fuel companies that enabled ongoing Russian propaganda of new Nazism, imperialism, and colonialism, which later, as we see, resulted in war. When I've been preparing to this conversation, it's, it was quite heavy for me just to stay positive uh, about the outcomes, because I see people dying, I see news every day, and we see how, how massive this Russia, Russian military attack is against us. But at the same time, I came here full of hope and full of optimism that our Ukraine uh, and our world uh, in many regions can overcome this temporary challenge. Yeah, it's serious, but let's not to make it uh, just Mm. in a way that we don't believe we win. We will win for sure. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I share this solidarity. And I am uh, grateful for all solidarity we are getting this, these days from all the countries, all communities, frontline communities, affected communities, indigenous communities, people of color. We equally appreciate everyone who expressing a big solidarity with us, and we are very grateful to everyone. Uh, so continuing, um, in the past days, as I said, we've witnessed unprecedented courage and bravery from Ukrainian warriors and civilians, and through the collective actions that countries of the world are taking to stop the war, as I said, there is hope because we want peace and justice. But there won't be peace in the world where Gazprom, Exxon, Total, British Petroleum and many, many others, and many financial institutions whom we know, uh, banks, including uh, and others, support their activities, uh, are allowed to extract, transport, and burn fossil fuels. Besides concrete acts of solidarity alongside calls of, for sanctions, pushing for a just transition to 100% of renewable energy, building uh, for everyone equally, a community owned, building a fossil free world is how the climate movement can outside of Ukraine contribute to building peace. And I'm here also to share a plan. Uh, they uh, shaped up exactly when the IPCC report uh, was published on February 2028. 20, IPCC report has highlighted that Yes, uh, the main outcome is we cannot consume that many energy from that dirty sources anymore. Uh, we cannot rely on unreliable sources uh, of energy with unproved effectiveness as cap all, all we know, triple C, carbon capture storage, and uh, <clears throat> many others. 
and we see impact is huge. But at the same time, we cannot rely in the same way for uh, using fossil fuels uh, anywhere on the planet. So what we um, what we decided to uh, offer as a movement, as a climate movement, even being in very tough uh, war environment so far. So, uh, and what we would like to share with you here uh, all. So the first one that we witnessed that the fossil fuels are equal to the mass of uh, uh, or to the weapon of a mass destruction. Uh, I don't think it needs some additional proofs or arguments as we see how fossil fuel finance uh, actually weaponized this war we have in Ukraine. And uh, therefore we call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to end new expansion of oil, gas, and coal production everywhere to have a fair and equitable phase out for uh, and just transition from fossil fuels to community owned clean energy uh, to 100% renewable energy. And we call European nation states, um, the US, Canada, China, India, Japan, South Korea, and all other importers of Russian oil and gas to divest, boycott and embargo all trade and assets of fossil fuels from Russia and divest everything they have in assets from Russian companies. And today we actually, just a few numbers, when you open the London Stock Exchange market value of some companies, they have huge decline, really massive and huge decline. For example, Sberbank, Russian bank, one of the main ones has declined from $75 billion of capitalization to 7 million. We see 10 times lower and Gazprom lost <coughs> more than a half of their capitalization. And this process in, is underway. Uh, I think we all need to act and to ask our governments and financial institutions and banks don't fund in fossil fuels with a priority in Russia, but everywhere else as well in every region of the uh, of our planet. And we also uh, produced, uh, drafted another letter. He, it's ready, it will be released soon to oil and gas financiers to seize all financial services for Russian energy companies uh, who are operating in the coal, oil and gas sectors. And of course, it's imperative that the world not simply repra uh, replace Russian produced fossil fuels with fossil fuels from other countries. I think we understand that justice means justice, uh, but not injustice uh, that we let uh, some others produce. Uh, we need to cut any ties with the fossil fuel industry in the closest perspective. And the last thing that we are currently running, it's a call on the Wall Street chief executive offices uh, to turn their back on Russian fossil fuel companies right now. And we are hopeful they will hear us from the streets where we are. And um, I also just making the final conclusions, I would just stress upon that um, those companies and institutions which we just discussed enabled regime of Putin to accumulate the resources it chooses to fund the war. Their profits needs to be seized to fund the transition and to support peace building, maybe in the form of tax or what other this disadvantage, disadvantage for them should be. And um, to remind us that our world is burning and millions of people face food and water shortages, along with humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine, because what's happening on the east of the country, in the center of the country is uh, absolutely inhumane. And to compare it with climate crisis, I cannot say, I, I can say this, that this cannot happen without ending our reliance, stop of this, end of this cannot happen without ending our reliance on the fossil fuels. But adding some positivity to that very, very gloomy picture, which we already have, but that's a reality. I would like to say that, of course, better world is possible and better world, it's what drives us towards the renewable energy, towards clean energy. And I have to say that many reports, not that many, but at least two reports 
uh, for that came out in 2021 just proves that well has enough potential of renewable energy. And if we simply double investments if into green te technologies, and we will trust a bit more to those green technologies that prove the affordability and prove their effectiveness and uh, prove, uh, prove their accessibility, even for communities in very distant, distant areas. So if we just can trust more, we can restore this justice and we can push forward this uh, green transition and the better world is definitely possible. I truly believe that we will dismantle these violent systems of oppressions that are underpinning the fossil fuel industry that allows corporations exploit coal, coal, oil, and gas, and threaten to our human rights, our lives, our environment, our climate, and our freedoms. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vitana, uh, for making the time to be with us today and for um, sharing your perspectives. Uh, and in an invitation, again, uh, to anyone attending this webinar to please use the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions you want, uh, you want to ask to uh, any panelists throughout this webinar, we will be uh, taking them in the Q&A section towards the end. Um, so we're now going to uh, pivot into looking a little bit more into uh, this uh, latest IPCC report that was released on Monday. Um, and we will be uh, going through those findings, uh, but also what they mean uh, for our climate justice movements and demands. Um, so we will first have Professor Wolfgang Kramer, who is an environmental geographer and a global ecologist. Uh, he's worked at many European universities and has been a contributor to the IPCC since 1992, uh, currently uh, working on the sixth assessment report. Um, and then to lead us into kind of translating those findings into what this means for us, for our movements, for our demands, we will have Asad Veyman. Uh, Executive Director of the Radical Anti-Poverty and Social Justice Organization, One Want. Uh, Assad is a leading climate justice activist whose work has helped to reframe, re reframe uh, the climate justice, uh, the climate crisis as a crisis of neoliberal capitalism, inequality and racism. Uh, and he has uh, worked with many social movements, both globally and nationally, over the last 35 years. Uh, so, Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Lisa. Can you hear, all hear me? Is the sound okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I, I was, of course, listening to Svetlana there and, and uh, of course, personally, want to say that I'm fully um, uh, in support of everything, everything she said. And I'm not supposed to um, make any reference to things that were being said during the last two weeks of session by the IPCC with government delegations uh, online for the so-called approval of the IPCC report. But uh, I do want to stretch the, 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 the limits from there a little bit by saying that when exactly one year ago, Another Svetlana, the head of the Ukrainian delegation, announced to us that she um, was having to leave uh, in the middle of the meeting, despite this being an online meeting, uh, because of the attack on that day. Um, I mean, it was uh, that was a moment that that I think none none of us will ever forget. Her. And uh, we were very pleased to to hear her back uh, a few days later. We don't know we don't know from where. But she insisted that the work must continue, of course, for, for precisely all those reasons that, that have been um, uh, listed and given by, 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 by the Svetlana present in this meeting. So I think I, I have no official mandate, but I'm, I'm sure that everyone in the, in the IPCC, including, including all government delegations there, and I really mean all, uh, are in full support of the Ukrainian people at this at this stage. Again, no official statement that that's my, my personal interpretation of the situation. Now, so you um, 
I, I want to talk just a little bit about process for the IPCC. And one reason for that is that I'm somehow sure that most of you uh, already know uh, the key messages that we are uh, that we have been um, confirming in, the, in this particular report. I will also say about uh, talk about some of the things that are new. And I, I, but I, since I only have a few minutes, what I want to do is to give you like a uh i am um, an indication of how to of how to read the, the the report when you when you've downloaded it but first about the process very quickly and i think it's it's really important that the, that the activist movement understands that uh, that when the ipcc was first established it was a call by governments governments said uh, that we want to come together and have the united nations support in finding suitable information about the risks associated with climate change. It's not some kind of group of scientists that got together and said, oh, we we'll do this or that. No, it was a call by governments. And this is still uh, something that is co core to the operation. So, the, um, uh, so, for example, for this particular uh, report, we've, we've worked for about five years. You've maybe seen the, the numbers. We were 270 people. We've evaluated 34,000 scientific publications. Uh, but the whole point, in a way, of that is to come to the meeting that we had last week and the week before, present the main key findings to government representatives and really to gov uh, representatives of all governments in the world and ask them, do you understand what we are saying? And this, uh, do, we under do you understand that um, in practical terms, that means that sentence by sentence is projected on the screen and the question is asked, do you understand, do you hear us? And this is a unique opportunity that none of us uh, otherwise has in life. Um, and what often comes back from governments is that they say, well, are you really sure about that? Or could, uh, there are some things that we don't understand. So we actually work on the text still in, uh, with governments, but it's not a negotiation procedure. It's very important to that uh, to us. It is a, an, an, an communication exercise, if you will. It's an attempt to clarify the message and to make it even more clear and un unequivocal. And then at the end, and this was formally uh, last Sunday morning, uh, there comes a moment when, when uh, governments are asked in a consensus decision, do you approve of this summary for policymakers? And approve means, have you understood what we are saying here? And, and so that very moment um, is crucial for the entire process because from now on, uh, for any one of these reports, you and I, as citizens, we can go to our respective governments or international organizations and we can say, there's nothing to discuss here. You have already not taken notice of, of the message. What we need to discuss now is what to do. And, uh, and that's, that's really important that it's, uh, that it's being understood. And it was just to fill that in also, it, it's a very bad idea halfway through this process to kind of leak um, early drafts because uh, that, that really actually helps absolutely nobody. Um, uh, the draft that was leaked at the time one year ago was, was radically different from what we have today. And, and, uh, and it's like if you're working on, a, on, on an article or on something and somebody sends around an early version of it, it doesn't really help you to make a better article. The, the, the kind of suspicion at the time was, and I'm saying that here so clearly because it came out of the part of the activist movement, uh, the suspicion was that everything that goes on is going to be dilution of the message. That is absolutely not true. I mean, if anybody wants to make the comparison, now I'm not going to do it, but if anybody wants to do it, you will see that it's not a diluted message. Okay, enough about that process. You also know that last August, the first part of the report was published, which was about the physics of the climate system and about the scenarios and about the, uh, uh, the, the projections that we have for for the ocean and for the atmosphere and all of that, which has basically told us that we are at 1.1 degree and that we are, um, uh, of course, do not see, uh, that we do not currently see neither a flattening of, uh, of the uh, emissions uh, nor of, uh, of climate change itself. This report was about the vulnerability of ecosystems and people 
to that change and also about the possibilities for adaptation. And uh, since you can all read it, let me just uh, just tell you some kind of fundamental news uh, as compared to earlier reports. Uh, the first one is that much clearer than before, ecosystems and biodiversity are seen as a part of the world that is equally important as humanity and, and that actually interacts with humanity. That may sound like a very kind of uh, beautiful statement, but it's very real. I mean, we, we know that there are very few ecosystems on the planet that are not affected by human action, not only agriculture and forestry and, and fisheries, but virtually every place on the planet, every ecosystem is under some influence from people. And, and more important, there's no human being on the planet that doesn't depend on ecosystems. So the, the whole analysis has been turned around a little bit from earlier ones in order to point this out, to point to the risks for the ecosystems and to point to the risks for people that depend on the ecosystems. And that means a lot for climate justice because it, it's, um, it is uh, something that, that all people share on the planet. It's not just uh, some some... It's not only indigenous people that are living close to nature, but they are they too. But it's also people in industrialized countries who depend to a much larger degree than is usually recognized on, on ecosystems. Second point is that uh, impacts of, on, of climate change on ecosystems are observed now. They are not some kind of something in the future, they are observed now, and we have much more uh information from all over the world um you know, to show that basically there is no ecosystem on the planet that is not also affected by climate change so of course affected by many other things too let's not forget that it's forget it. it's effect they are affected by pollution by unsustainable land use by all these factors climate is not the only one but there's no ecosystem on the planet that is not affected by, by climate change and in most cases these are negative effects for the um, uh, future trends, there's also nothing really that should surprise you, that will surprise you, that uh, the tenden uh, tendencies are, of course, very bad. There are entire ecosystems that are that are disappearing, including the tropical reefs um, that, that uh, have a very high likelihood to be actually exterminated, uh, but also um, ecosystems uh, in the high Arctic and in, in mountain uh, areas and, and, and elsewhere. Um, there is a uh, an attempt in the report to re to answer a question that we think is coming up now. It's actually not being posed very much, but we think that as governments, or I think as governments, recognize that they are not reaching the Paris target, uh, which is kind of given, you know, we all know that they are not going, we're not going to stop, stay below 1.5 degrees. There is going to come up a, an argument from governments saying, yes, we will pass 1.5, but we have, will have so beautiful technology later in the century that we will come down again and then everything will be good. And we have missed Paris a little bit, but not so much. And now from an ecosystem point of view and livelihoods point of view, um, that is a very bad uh, idea because it essentially means that um, this would work if ecosystems were like a sponge, you know, that you can push a little bit and then it comes back. But in, in reality, of course, as you know, if you lose an ecosystem or if you lose much of the carbon store in an ecosystem, then this is not going to come back just because the temperatures come down. And what's worse is that, um, <clears throat> that uh, while you lose them, for many ecosystems, for the so-called high carbon ecosystems in the north and in, in the boreal zone, but also in the tropics. Um, while you go into this mode of total destruction, you will release additional carbon that even with your wonderful technology, which you, where you capture carbon from the atmosphere, you will have to capture even more in order to come down to, to in order to fulfill your plan of what we call the overshoot. That is something that has caused significant debate, and we are in early days of scientific understanding of that. But it's just the message is just over counting on the overshoot is not a good idea. Now, a few last words about the positive um, side. Uh, the um, another key feature of this report, different from earlier ones, is that it tries to focus on action 
not an all climate action because we will have a third report that will talk about reduction of, uh, of emissions. This one, this report doesn't talk about that, but about ac action for adaptation, for, for improving adaptation. And adaptation has basically several important aspects uh, uh, to it. First of all, it's already ongoing. Uh, sometimes it's uh, well organized, sometimes it's not very well organized. It's kind of natural also for people and ecosystems to adapt. Um, but there will be limits for that adaptation. There will be what we call hard limits. For example, when you talk about sea level rise, then to some degree coasts or, or uh, settlements on the coast can adapt by building sea walls or by, by changing in some other way. But there's always a hard limit. At one point, the sea level will have risen so much that you, you cannot adapt anymore. You have to displace yourself. So in adaptation, um, not everything can be done, but a lot more can be done. And that is, that is so, that's the important positive message um, that there are lots of good practice uh, in areas um, where we can have better um, adaptation. And I just want to mention two. One is in the agricultural systems where uh, a, a switch to what we call agroecology, which is a big, basically, rule book of running farms in a more sustainable way and not depend as much on, on uh, uh, fertilizers and, and pesticides, but, but to make uh, farms uh, function as an internal um, system uh, that's more stable and more resilient. Um, there's a lot of potential in this, and and, uh, the, and the report gives many many examples for that. And the other area where adaptation is possible and ongoing, but could on, it could go on uh, much more, much faster, is cities, urban uh, urban development. Uh, cities have the great advantage that they are dynamic anyway. That uh, all over the world, cities are changing all the time. Uh, in in developing countries, uh, many cities that we will have in 2050, they are not even built yet because we have, and we welcome that we have a growth in the in in, in young people. Um, but this uh, means an opportunity. This means that uh, those cities that are in uh, in um, transformation or even being built, they can be made climate resilient. And, and that is a, a key word of the report, uh, the cl climate resilient development. And it gives many positive examples. And I think the climate activist movement can use the report as, a, as an inspiration. It is not something that you, 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 you can use to, to explain why action is necessary. Of course, that as well, as well. And that was the first part of what I said. But you can also use it as a source of inspiration for positive action. And we've really tried hard to to insist on that. Yes, indeed, I should uh, I should come to a conclusion. Thank you, Lisa. I could talk a lot more, and I'm happy to answer any any questions uh, maybe at the end of the of the session. But thanks again for for inviting me. I, for me, it's a, it's actually an honor, and I'm 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 really really proud to speak to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. Uh, without further ado, I'm just going to pass over to Asad. Uh, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are joining in the world. I see people from every corner of the world are with us this uh, afternoon. Um, thanks also to Lise and Nico and all the 350 crew for organizing this event and the interpreters for ensuring language justice and, and solidarity to Svetlana and the people of Ukraine and all those facing occupation and war from Palestine, Yemen, Western Sahara, and West Papua and, and the countless black and brown people in Ukraine who are currently seeking safety, whose lives are not deemed as val valuable as others. And, and of course to Wolfgang for setting out what the climate science is behind the report. The, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres described the report as an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. And for many, especially those on the front lines of injustice, this report simply reinforces everything we have been saying for decades. That incremental siloed climate action is failing, that delayed means death, that every second counts and every degree matters, that the crisis was already here, and that we're not all in the same boat. 
when it comes to those who are responsible for the crisis, who are being already most impacted, who will be most impacted in the future, when and why. And this report includes, you know, dire warnings that already half the world, approximately 3.3 to 3.6 billion people are already highly vulnerable to climate change and that potentially up to 75% of the global population could be exposed to life-threatening climate conditions due to heat and humidity by 2100. The report is also comprehensive and, and, and just covers so many issues that we can't do justice to the work of all those who contributed to the report. Um, you know, it covers everything from the 150 biggest cities have seen a 500% ex increase in extreme heat since 1980, that already 1.5 to 2.5 billion people are affected by water scarcity, that is going to increase as we uh, uh, breach the 1.5 and head towards 2 degrees, that many of our ecosystems are already at the point of no return, and that at 1.5 degrees we will see the demise of overwhelming majority of coral reefs, irreversible loss of glaciers and polar ice, that our human and natural systems are interconnected, and that these critical ecosystems underpin the lives and livelihoods of the poorest people, from everything from access to fresh water to food production. It also sets out very clearly that it's Africa, Central America, South Asia, and small islands who will be most impacted, and that those who are poor, who are black, brown, women and indigenous are 15 times more vulnerable than those in rich countries like the UK where I'm based. And that the current climate plans will lead to hundreds of millions of more people suffering from extreme weather impacts, food shortages, escalating economic damages and natural systems collapses. One study in the report, you know, estimates that there's been nearly a 10% yield reduction in four major crops in the last century. And this report states that climate change is already affecting, and quote, all dimensions of food security. And as a result, there is high confidence that the number of people at risk of hunger, malnutrition, and diet-related diet mortality will increase in the future. And those projections, you know, range up to 80 million compared to a world with no climate change. But again, really important, nearly 80% of those at-risk population are projected to occur in Africa and Asia. And that rising temperatures are, like, are going to unleash millions of tons of carbon as forests die back and we have permafrost thawing, equivalent to 15 years of greenhouse gas emissions. For the climate justice movement, it's clear, and it's always been clear, that this crisis is an intersected crisis of economic, racial, gender and social justice. That it's our systems of exploited ecosystems, resource extraction, promotion of unsustainable econo economic growth that is driving the crisis and determining who faces the worst impact. But as the report states, and I quote, Vulnerability at different spatial levels is exasperated by inequity and marginalization linked to gender, ethnicity, low income or combinations thereof, especially for indigenous people and local communities. And it's this inequity and marginalization that is recognized that is due to historical systems of injustice that shape the climate crisis. And it may very well be the first time that the IPCC report mentions this, but the report states present development challenges causing high vulnerability are influenced by historical and ongoing patterns of inequity such as colonialism. So this report is very, very clear. It states that many of the impacts over 1.5 will be irreversible as Wolfgang said. And yet we all know we're currently heading towards a warming of at least 2.7 degrees. And as Wolfgang again said, we have governments banking on net zero by 2050, overshoots and trying to dial back temperatures through carbon dioxide removal through unproven and risky technologies. At yesterday's IPCC conference, for those who might have missed it, it was stated very clearly. They said, the world we live in today is not the world we will live in in 10 or 20 years. And any further delay in concerted global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure, secure a livable and sustainable future for us. So that is the world we live in. Uh, 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 so what is the world we wanna live in and how do we get there? I think for us as the climate justice movements, our demands must be clear. Um, they are not only about mitigation, but clearly also about adaptation. So we must fight for 1.5, rooted in equity and climate justice, that matters. And we all know that the carbon budget for 1.5 could be gone by the end of this decade and even two degrees at risk in the coming decades. So reiterating our demands about real zero cuts 
by 2030 by rich countries, a no more blame game to the global side has to be a central component of our demands. Urgency. As you've heard, we have hard limits to our adaptive measures. So, of course, we must continue exposing fallacy of net zero and the dangerous solutions. And it was shocking to see, of course, even in this report that you have mention of solar radiation, as well as, of course, CCS, CCS carbon capture storage, which, as we all know, is a license to continue to pollute. So, of course, all of us as climate justice movements, of course, we have must continue to fight for an end to fossil fuels and those who finance them. And I'm, I'm fully supportive of the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. But our fight has got to go beyond saying no to fossil fuels and demand everyone has the right to energy, equitable access to public early owned renewable energy systems and an end to the energy poverty for half the world that are denied that most basic of rights. And that means we can't simply be saying 100% renewable energy if that is based on the same model of extraction injustice as fossil fuels. And we have to make the right to food and food sovereignty a cornerstone of our demands and not just as an afterthought. This report sets out very, very clearly and we know as Wolfgang has said, the most effective adaptive measure end industrial food systems, land rights, and farmer and peasant led agroecology. It also is very, very clear in this report we're not fighting for the unmet promise of 100 billion uh, in, in, in the UNFCCC, but finance to the scale needed, which uh, UNCTAD estimated would be at least about one and a half trillion a year to meet both the climate and inequality crisis. So yes, the fight for loss and damage is absolutely critical. And it's important for all of everybody to know that even in this summary report, the summary for policymakers, the US and other rich countries did their best to take out uh, and minimize the language around loss and damage and any potential mention of their liability. So as we head towards COP27, we don't want loss and damage dialogues. We actually, as climate justice demands, must be demanding climate reparations, cancellation of global debt, wealth taxes, and fixing this global economy, which is, we all know is rigged to benefit the very ones destroying our planet for profit. Now, some in the climate movement, when they look at these reports and have been saying to the climate justice movement, you know, you've got to be pragmatic and go for incremental change and not call for system change. I think this report says very, very clearly to me how wrong that approach is, how deadly that approach is, and those who've been arguing that, how complicit they have been in this failure to act. So climate justice can no longer be an empty slogan, something for people to stick on banners or leaflets. A climate justice must mean adopting a radical anti-colonial lens to look at this crisis. And fixing this crisis is only possible through that radical transformative action. So we've had scientists who said we need, and this report again talks about inequality and poverty. They said we need a new social compact that addresses poverty as well as climate. So our climate justice demands must include those adaptive measures, universal public health systems, living wages and workers' rights, land rights for indigenous communities, the right to food and renewable energy, the right to decent housing and health, all of those are there in that report. As the IPCC co-author Ed Carr said, uh, just tweaking our social and economic systems is not going to get us to a climate resilient future. We need transformational demands, everything from our food, our energy, our transformation, our transportation, but also our politics and society. So we know that there are major challenges present for us in terms of uh, for both this present and future, and that is all based around political will. So support for this change, of course, means making sure that the most vulnerable are heard. And again, this report says very, very clearly that those most impacted have to be at the decision-making table to decide the solutions that are needed and be part of, of, of that political process. But it also means about building the social license and pressure we need. I look at this report not as a, I'm going to, not as a, a, a moment of a doom, but as actually as a moment of hope because it's clear that cooperation and solidarity is key for this decade, and that it's political pressure from people like us and from our movements that will make a difference. So not only do we need to meet demands that meet the science of the urgency to tackle this climate crisis, and I'm gonna wrap up here now, Lise, my takeaway is it's absolute time for a radical global Green New Deal, committed to an equitable response to 1.5, tackling inequality and poverty, living within planetary limits and undoing systems of injustice. No one can deny that it's not needed, but that means we have to uh, have that vision of the world we wanna create and the demands that get there. But most critically of all, 
We need to think and talk about how do we build our collective power. This report sets out very clearly in my mind that change is coming. That is now inevitable. The only question that is up for debate is what kind of change, who will benefit and who will be sacrificed. And in that fight, there's only one side we could be on, the side of people, the side of planet, and the side, and the side of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Asad. Thank both of you. Uh, I feel really bad time checking on um, on such inspiring contributions. Uh, so thank you, Wolfgang, for uh, kind of helping us go through uh, the findings of the IPCC report and uh, and what they actually mean. And thank you, Asad, for as ever speaking with uh, so much truth and power. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, pause, uh, remind uh, everyone on this webinar to use the Q&A uh, icon if you have any questions for um, our uh, speakers, and to invite the speakers who are going to uh, contribute now to speak slowly and clearly uh, so that interpreters can uh, follow. Um, and so in, in the next section, uh, we are going to hear from, uh, we're going to hear perspectives um, from different people on what, why should we still have hope? Um, and what does people power look like and mean to you? Uh, so we're going to hear from uh, three different uh, people. I'm going to introduce our first speaker on this, uh, Tasnim Esop. Uh, Tasnim, who is currently the executive director of uh, Climate Action Network International. Uh, she was also an anti-apartheid activist from an early age in different capacities until the democratic elections of 94. Uh, and during this time, she was also a student and youth activist, a teacher and a trade unionist, and is now a very core cool part of our climate justice movement. So Tasnim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lisa, and greetings to everybody. Uh, let me add my voice of solidarity to the peoples of Ukraine and to thank Sudlana for her uh, input into this discussion, important input into this discussion uh, today, and for her taking the time to be with us under such uh, conditions. So uh, much appreciation for that. So, you know, I think the previous speakers have really laid the, con spelt out the context and the findings of the IPCC report and Assad has very, um, you know, clearly spelled out what the implications of this report is for the work we need to do as movements going forward. And so Lisa, I, I'm, I know that I've been asked to talk about you know, what can we do in terms of building the hope? And Assad also refers to this, that, you know, we shouldn't see this as a moment of, of despair, but of hope. I would want to say that we would need to, at this time, really have a healthy balance between maintaining and building hope and having anger. Both are important to keep people mobilized and galvanized and for us to be very clear that we cannot shy away from telling the truth. That is the worst thing you can ever do in terms of building people's power. So we have to be honest and we have to be truthful when we do um, build what is the only hope in my view, people's power. The IPCC report refers to historical injustice and, and as uh, Assad is extremely excited about the fact that for the first time in an IPCC report, the C word was used, you know, it's always a very uncomfortable thing, but a science report now refers to what we've been saying, uh, you know, is the root of uh, much of this crisis, colonialism. And so certainly we have to look at this, when we deal with hope, and anger, we have to look both at the kind of historical injustice and inequity, but also the current injustice and inequity. And we cannot see 
the IPCC report in a, in a context that is absent from the wider context that we are all living through. And so when we think about this report and what it means in terms of the impacts of people and again, those who are most vulnerable and those exactly who have been least responsible for this crisis, which is the fundamental injustice, then certainly we have to look at what's been happening to us in recent times. We have the climate crisis. We get hit by the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic lays bare all of those fault lines in society of the injustice and inequity and lays bare, which is a horror, the fact that rich nations have demonstrated that in the face of global crises like this, they would rather take care of their own and their own self-interest and the interests of profit-making uh, corporates. That's the track record in the pandemic. And that's why we have vaccine apartheid. But then we now also dealing with this war in Ukraine. And again, we see that dimension of, you know, the world, especially what is called Western democracies, mobilizing as they should justifiably in support of Ukraine, recognizing that the same level of effort, of support, etc., is not being um, given to those who have been living through occupation and invasion and conflict, and largely, again, in the developing world, in the global south. Now these, and at the same time, all of this is happening and we see increasing inequality, right? And we are told about, you know, billionaires that are making so much wealth in a time of so much suffering. Now you tell me, you know, do we only enter into this and build people's power off the back of false optimism? Or do we use this moment also to be truthful about the horror that we are experiencing, especially those who are black and brown in the world. We just have to be truthful. And I believe that truthfulness is where we can be hopeful because it is what is you know, necessary to build people's power, to organize, not just mobilize, but to organize people across the world so that the kind of solidarity that we need and that uh, Assad refers to this international cooperation that is not coming from our governments, but would of necessity have to come from the people across the world. The impacts that are being uh, spoken about in the IPCC report, of course, as Assad says, has been felt and mainly felt by those uh, marginalized uh, communities and peoples, and especially in the global south, but we also know that the impacts are being felt across the world, including in the global north. And here we need to understand that even in the developed world, those who feel those impacts the hardest are once again marginalized communities, uh, you know, black and, and, and people of color communities, indigenous communities. So let us be very clear why we need that solidarity. And so just, uh, a quick one to say, to say we, we, as part of this hopefulness, of course, we need to build our power across the world as people standing together, recognizing we have an important fight to win together, not just on the climate front, across the board in terms of justice. But secondly, we not only have to build power but we have to be far more smart about how we use power. That's where we are at now. We really, you know, many of, I am a, <laughs> leading a big civil society network. We, we're not very good at actually being sharp about tactics. And we tried this though in the Glasgow COP. I want to say one of the big issues, Assad, for us, is loss and damage finance, as you know. 
as a network with all of you. We went into Glasgow, even though it wasn't on the agenda, we proved that we could put it on the agenda. You know, we always say, but that's the agenda. Let's set agendas. We set the agenda and we got the attention on loss and damage finance, no matter how much the UK government didn't want that attention or the US government, we got the attention. And so it, it was an important lesson for all of us in the movement of how not only do we build power, but how we should use power, not just in the cops, but generally across the board in the work that we do at national levels. It is in that united, big united front that we were able to actually use our power to force an agenda and to get a bit of movement. Now, Assad, not dialogues, as you said, now we must use our power because this, this issue of loss and damage finance cannot be ignored, cannot be blurred with all these other issues that we tend to put on our tables because what's at stake is the lives, once again, of the poorest in the world, those who are suffering inequality and massive injustice. It is our duty, our moral duty, to respond to that need. And so in Africa, at the COP, we have to land a decision on a finance facility for loss and damage. There can't be anything else. Uh, we can't come out of that COP with nothing in hand, another dialogue, and things kick down the line. This IPCC report, is that signal for urgency. Let's use our power. That's the hope we have. Let's build power, use power, and do it more and more with courage, with audacity, with boldness. That to me, Lise, and all of you, is what I see hope in. That's the only thing I see hope in. People's power and using that power to bring about the radical change that Assad so clearly spoke about. Thank you for listening to me and I'm sorry for going over time, um, but thanks for having me. Thank you, Tasnim. I think I will uh, come back to the recording of your contribution whenever I'm feeling a bit hopeless. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm now gonna go over to our next speaker on hope and uh, people power. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Amanda Costa, who is a climate activist, UN Youth Ambassador, Brazil's delegate to the uh, G20 Youth Summit, and who is also the founder of the Instituto Perifa Sustentabel. Uh, apologies for my bad Portuguese. Uh, so Amanda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Amanda. I am a youth climate activist, and I'm very glad to be here to share these messages and to say that as a Black woman, I need to make my voice to be heard. But before I talk a little bit about what I want to show to you, I'd like to, to make sure that everyone it's here, everybody's listening, everyone is paying attention to this message because for a long time, when we are a lot of time sitting in front of a computer, sometimes we are like looking at our things and uh, dispersed. But now that I call the attention of everyone, I want to read an article that I prepared last year. So I'd like to invite every single person that's here to close your eyes and to dream with me. We are living in a very, very, very hard time. We are in the middle of a crisis. We are in the middle of a war. But as a youth, as a black girl, I want to invite you to dream because I believe that our world can be constructed for us in the dreams. So let's go. Letter of intent to build a harmonious world for all. Planet Earth lives, birds sing, the ink blows, the power of nature, and humanity deals in harmony with all living beings. The capitalist patriarchal system is in the past. There is no more exploitation or subalternity. 
we managed to develop a model based on racial equity, social justice, and political engagement where everyone has space for engagement, mobilization, and participation. It started as an utopia, a distant dream created in our imagination. However, it happened. We made a strategic turn that allowed us to stop surviving and start living. We have a beautiful, pleasant, and evident life. In this life, everyone is well like it, works with purpose, and invests quality time with the people they love. This change was also internal, in which food was an essential part of the process. We learned about the importance of organic meals and replaced monocultures and large states with agroforests managed by small farmers. We put free food distribution points in our cities. We built a true sustainable fest. In addition to sharing food, we learned to share love. We share fears, we externalize our joys, and we always seek equality, fraternity, and freedom. In this world, there is no place for oppression. Power struggles are in the past. All have understood their place in social transformation and are committed to the common good reasons. The change is starting in our heart and spill over the whole society. We learn to encourage the reverse circle, practice sustainable consumption and develop a clean and renewable energy system for every home on our planet. In addition, we are able to provide access to free and quality health service for the entire population, encourage activities based on preventing medicine and cultivate good habits, practice physical exercise regularly and eat healthy. And great to see how much we are involved. Women, Black people, and different youth played as an essential role in this transformation. They brought the needs and demands that helped the great decision makers to legislate for the development of the different nations of the globe. During this transition, we understood how to dialogue with the different and decide to seek common interests transforming individual goals into collective goals that aim an everyone progress. Our education has transcended. We have abundant hierarchy and passivity and found horizontally creativity and self-direction. Schools adopt teaching from diverse sources using methods and data from the five continents, Latin America, North America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. With quality education, we are able to overcome the challenges that market our past, um, climate, health, democratic, economic, social, and environmental crisis. We reverse the scenario and move to a sustainable planet. Everyone decides to see themselves as a part of the solution. They think critically and choose to act. Every human being understands their responsibility with the social structure of our world. It used to be something revolutionary, but now it's part of our reality. We developed an inclusive, collaborative, and sustainable planet. Now I'd like to ask you everyone to open your eyes and start to think how fair we are from this reality. We are in the middle of a war. Last week, a friend of mine sent me a message asking if I can share uh, what is happening in Ukraine. And why is this happening? Why we are living so far from the letter that I read it to you? And what is our role in all of this situation? How can we start to change? The IPCC report says that we need to change right now because if we don't, my generation, we will not have time. We will not have future. We will not have food. We will not have house. We will not have a quality of life. 
So what is our role in this transformation? What do you need to do to solve all this problem? In my opinion, it's not just about money. We have enough money, but we need to put this money in the right place. We need to put this money in the countries of global south. We need to empower other black girls, other indigenous girls to be in the decision-making space. We don't have time to wait the white men, the decision makers to decide their lives. So everyone who is here is part of this transformation. It's start to think with yourself, what could you do to accelerate this process? I don't know, I am doing part of my job. I have Perifas Tintável, with aims to mobilize Brazilian Black youth to be part of this debate, to participate in the decision-making pro process. Last year, we brought four Black women to COP26 to be sitting with the decision-makers is to put our demands on the table. But it's not enough. We don't need just four Black girls of the global south sitting with these decision makers. We need to empower all the youth, all the black youth, all the indigenous youth. We need to give value to the grassroots. The change is local, but who is seeing this change happen? Second point, we need to combat the patriarchal white supremacist capitalist system based on exploitation disputes. This war is a consequence of this model. We need to change the model. We need to accelerate. We cannot just tolerate what is happening. And the third, we need to capacity young people to be in the decision maker space. Open my vulnerability to you guys. It's very hard to be here. My English is not perfect. I do a lot of mistakes. But I am curious enough to open my computer and to see my message to you. Other Black Brazilian girls, they don't. So what could you do to capacity them to be here? And to conclude my message, I would like to read a very famous Brazilian writer. Her name is Carolina Maria de Jesus. She says, a vida é igual a um livro. Só depois de ter lido, sabemos o que encerra. E nós, quando estamos no fim da vida, é que sabemos como a vida decorreu. A minha até aqui tem sido preta. Preta é a minha pele. Preta é o lugar de onde eu moro. Translate to English. Life is like a book. Only after reading, it do we know what it contains. And when we are at the end of life, we know how life went. Mine, so far, has been black. Black is my skin. Black is where I live. We need to talk about environmental racism. We need to darken the climate debate. So I would like to know, are you prepared to make it diversity? much more than a pretty speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, and your English is great. Um, absolutely no apologies around this. Uh, and thank you for your, um, your truth and your powerful words. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our last uh, speaker for this slot on uh, hope and people power. Um, so Francisco Javier Vera Manzanares uh, is a 12 year old climate and life activist in Colombia, who uh, is a strong advocate for the inclusion of children's voices in the big discussions of our time, 
uh, and especially for the voices of children in the global south. Um, now, before I pass on to Francisco, I'm just going to flag that Francisco will be speaking in Spanish. Uh, so um, English speakers, uh, please also uh, make sure that you click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen uh, to access English uh, interpretation whilst Francisco speaks. Uh, so Francisco, uh, the floor is yours. Bueno, pues, eh, muy buenas tardes, días, pues donde estén, noches también. Eh, pues ya me presentaron, mi nombre es Francisco Vera Manzanares, tengo 12 años de edad y soy de Colombia y soy activista climático y en defensa de la vida eh, en mi país, en Latinoamérica. Eh, pues primero que todo agradecerles por, por permitir estar un niño que evidentemente pues no muchos niños alzan su voz, ¿no? O tienen los espacios para hacerlo. Eh, y pues bueno, primero eso, gracias también a 350 grados por la posibilidad de, de eso, de permitir espacios para que todos podamos alzar nuestras voces eh, desde generaciones muy atrás hasta nuestras generaciones del presente. Eh, yo quiero, pues como lo hemos hecho la mayoría, enfatizar en el tema justamente, ni siquiera tanto del informe, bueno, sí, mi intervención va a ir en torno a... a a este informe del IPCC, pues el sexto informe, pero también enfatizar en el tema de la guerra, que hoy ya muchos lo han nombrado, ¿no? Eh, yo creo que para empezar eso, ¿no? Que no solo hay que ver la guerra de Ucrania y de Rusia como un conflicto eh, o como el único conflicto que hay, ha sido el más mediático, ¿no? Pero realmente en el mundo hay bastantes conflictos, hay miles de conflictos a lo largo del mundo que en realidad siempre en donde sean, sea en, en Myanmar, en la misma Asia o sea en mi país, eh, para no ir muy lejos, pues siempre van a poner... De, de lado y principalmente los intereses del poder, ¿no? Que van a terminar afectando eh, pues los derechos del pueblo y de los ciudadanos, ¿no? Eh, yo creo que eso es lo más importante para destacar, que estos conflictos bélicos lo único que nos generan son, son caos, ruina, miseria a nuestra humanidad y como lo dije el de Ucrania no es el único, lo podemos reflejar en, en Armenia y Azerbaiyán en Yemen y Arabia Saudita en el Sahel, con los piratas en Somalia o la República del Sahara Occidental en, en la dictadura que hay en Myanmar, en las dos Coreas o pues justamente en, en mi mismo país en donde durante este año mmm, más de 30 defensores eh, personas ciudadanos de, de Colombia han sido asesinados, defensores de la vida y del medio ambiente que ponen y que dedican pues sí, su tiempo y, y, y su vida a defender el medio ambiente y la sociedad le responde de esa manera. Es decir, que yo creo que debemos ver este conflicto, esta guerra, eh, no solo como una guerra declarada entre nosotros, sino una guerra también eh, cruel e injusta con el medio ambiente, porque por medio de todos estos conflictos estamos financiando la, un modelo extractivista de los recursos naturales, un, un modelo neoliberal que explota la naturaleza, pero que también explota de alguna manera pues, al pueblo ¿no? y a sus ciudadanos, y que dejen del medio a los niños, a las mujeres y a todos los afectados que terminan ahí, a todos los refugiados y demás. Y... Por otra parte, también es importante destacar que esa guerra eh, en contra del medio ambiente que hemos declarado ya desde hace mucho eh, debe terminar y yo creo que por medio de, de, de esta pequeña charla hemos visto varias formas de cómo acabarla por medio de la educación, nuestras herramientas para combatir el cambio climático de ser esas, esas mismas, la educación, el poder como lo mismos, eh, la mismísima financiación, que yo creo que en vez de estar financiando guerras, financiando masacres, debemos estar financiando eh, entre naciones, entre países y entre gobiernos, una cooperación internacional que vaya de la mano para asumir 
eh, este problema que amenaza con nuestra existencia. O sea, yo lo que más quiero destacar es que finalmente esto no nos va a servir a na de nada. A los únicos que le interesa la guerra es al poder y a los gobiernos y que ahí los que quedan afectados son los niños, los más vulnerables, los, los que en nuestra sociedad históricamente han estado marginalizados, que nunca se les tiene la posibilidad o se les da la posibilidad de alzar su voz, de ser escuchados o de por lo menos garantizar la paz y los derechos. Eh, entonces eso, que en vez de estar financiando guerras debemos financiar un futuro y presente mejor para esta generación que está siendo tan afectada y, y, tan, y tan sufrida, si se puede decir, tan, sí, tan afectada por el calentamiento global. Y es que yo creo que ni siquiera debemos pensar que el cambio climático es una consecuencia para el futuro, sino que es que ya en este momento ya hay gente que no tiene agua, ya hay gente que no tiene que comer, ya hay gente que tiene que migrar en estos momentos. Niños de mi misma edad en el sudeste asiático, en todas las costas de África, de América, que tienen que huir por las consecuencias del calentamiento global. Por eso es que hoy quienes tenemos la posibilidad de ejercer un activismo a favor de la vida, debemos hacer todo lo posible, porque desde los gobiernos, las empresas y los ciudadanos pongamos todos los medios y las herramientas, no a favor de una guerra, no a favor de una, una guerra entre nosotros, sino también con el medio ambiente y con la biodiversidad si no pongamos todas las herramientas a favor de la vida y del medio ambiente, que finalmente es nuestra mayor preocupación y que cuando hagamos eso nos vamos a dirigir hacia un futuro y unos resultados mucho más reconfortantes, mucho más inspiradores. Realmente toda labor tiene su fruto y si hoy nos comprometemos no solo como ciudadanos, sino que también nos comprometemos a exigirle a los gobiernos que dejen de declararle la guerra al medio ambiente por intereses económicos como el oro negro, es decir, el petróleo, o por la ganadería, o por cualquier economía que sea, o por el transporte, más bien de, el cambio de hacer esto debemos es promocionar e impulsar todas las voces eh, desde los territorios, las voces de los niños, de las niñas, de las personas de color, ahorita lo vimos, de las mujeres, de, de los pueblos originarios indígenas que son tan importantes desde su visión fundamental, primordial y, y ancestral. Y realmente, como lo decía yo, como creo que cada labor tiene sus frutos, pues si hoy nos comprometemos con, con una acción climática ya, y nos comprometemos a ejercer nuestra ciudadanía para la vida y a pedirle a los gobiernos que gobiernen para la vida, vamos a tener un planeta que no se dirija hacia el calentamiento global y hacia el calentamiento desmedido, hacia el calentamiento eh, alarmante, peligroso, vertiginoso de la temperatura. Porque finalmente sabemos que si no hacemos esto, vamos a llegar a, a nuestro fin, así, así es, es la sexta extinción masiva, ¿no? Es una realidad, o sea, ya está sucediendo, entonces es necesario hacer esto. Pero yo creo que aquí no, no es importante destacar que ustedes hagan eh, algo que ya están haciendo, sino lo que hay que destacar es que debemos es más bien presionar por medio del poder que tiene la ciudadanía a los gobiernos, para lo que dije antes, para que creen políticas a favor de la vida y para que dejemos de estar financiando guerras que lo único que hacen es acabarnos a nosotros mismos y atacar a nuestra misma humanidad. Es que no creo que haya especie más tonta en el planeta Tierra que sea capaz, no de... de, de cazar a otras especies por instinto, sino de matarse a sí misma, matar a sus congéneros, que es una frase, una palabra muy importante, congéneros, venimos de la misma semilla, del mismo animal, de la misma célula, y a pesar de eso se nos olvida que somos hermanos, y que quienes hoy se unan por la lucha y la defensa de la paz, no solo van a estar luchando por una causa colectiva en favor de la paz entre nosotros, sino también pues con la paz, en, con el medio ambiente, ¿no? con la biodiversidad y con los recursos naturales. Pero esto también debe conllevar un cambio social muy importante, ¿no? porque es que el cambio climático sabemos que no es ajeno a la realidad social y política del mundo.
Por lo menos en mi país, la gente pobre en la que no tiene posibilidad por justamente el cambio climático, las inundaciones, los deslizamientos, eh, las precipitaciones más agravadas, no tiene la posibilidad de llegar a un hospital, no tiene la posibilidad de ir a estudiar por las trochas que hay por el camino. Y yo conozco ya a muchos. Es la realidad que se vive en mi mismo país, y no solo en Colombia, sino es que en todos los territorios del mundo. Entonces, también es eso que la justicia climática también debe ir en paralelo a la lucha por la justicia social, porque sin una no puede haber otra, necesitamos de las dos, de los derechos humanos para garantizar el medio ambiente, un ambiente sano. Entonces, yo creo que eso es lo más importante a destacar. Ah, y por cierto, pues obvio, obvio, destacar la participación de todas las voces como lo dije anteriormente, de todas las voces de los niños, por ejemplo, de los niños no solo del norte, de Europa o de Estados Unidos, sino también los niños de Asia, de África, que muy bien los podemos ver en este mapa de acá, o del mismo continente, de América, y no solo los niños de la ciudad, sino también los niños del campo, de la ruralidad, que quedan eh, pues, olvidados de alguna forma, ¿no? marginalizados e invisibilizados, como lo dije anteriormente, en medio de todos estos conflictos. Entonces, eh, yo creo que ese es el principal mensaje, que hoy tratemos de poner todas nuestras herramientas hacia el camino de la paz y de una justicia a favor de la vida. Porque finalmente... Cuando nos referimos a la vida, no solo es la vida del medio ambiente, sino la vida de nosotros, obviamente. Por eso es que ese concepto integral tan general es tan hermoso y tan bonito, la vida, la vida. Entonces, eh, pues yo básicamente quería transmitir ese mensaje, eh, agradecerles a todos los que hacen su trabajo por mi generación, por pensar en sus nietos y por pensar en, en los nietos de sus nietos, que lamentablemente si no hacemos algo ya, pues no van a tener un planeta en donde vivir, porque no hay planeta B, justamente. Entonces, eh, muchas gracias por eso a todos, eh, y bueno, pues que la lucha por la vida continúe, pues finalmente los intereses, como lo dije, de la guerra, en contra de nosotros y del medio ambiente, solo benefician al poder y oprimen al pueblo. Muchas gracias, Francisco, por tus palabras inspiradoras. Um, no, no, muchísimas gracias a, a ustedes. Es un honor y un gusto que también me permitan estar aquí como niño, hablando y representando la voz de otros niños. Uh, Okay, I hope everyone feels just as inspired uh, as I do right now. Uh, it's it's been a lot to process, um, so much that I have lost track of time, uh, and we now have <laughs> run out of time for questions. Uh, but we promise that we will uh, send you loads of materials and the recording and all of this. Um, And I think it was worth uh, allowing ourselves to just indulge in uh, listening to our speakers uh, fully. Um, I am now going to pass over to uh, someone else uh, to bring us back together and close this webinar. Uh, so I'm going to pass to Luisa Neubauer, uh, who is a 25 years old uh, German climate activist and an active organizer with Fridays for Future Germany, and is also the author of uh, several books on climate change and activism. Uh, so Luisa, please uh, take the floor and help us close this space. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for passing it on. Hello, I am calling in from Hamburg in, in Germany. I was on the train earlier, and I thought I would just quickly wrap up here, and I just found it's quite impossible to to pull together what we've heard. So I will just, as a, as a quick summary, as a, as a quick run through, um, share three thoughts um, of things that were discussed today by our incredible speakers who gave such important insights in such, such difficult times right now. And um, first of all, I think uh, what we're seeing right now, given, given the war that is happening just a few hundred kilometers from where I'm right now, 
Uh, we are seeing a war that is deeply intertwined with fossil fuel system, with the military com complex, with capitalism, imperialism, and the, and the patriarchy. And we're seeing that something that is often called intersectionality, that's often rated down as making things very complicated, is actually our lens right now to the root causes of the problems. And we're seeing right now that um, uh, we're seeing a, a violent conflict that was so um, incredibly um, talked about by our first speaker is, is, um, is rooted to many other of the environmental and inequality problems we are facing. And we're seeing that understanding the complexity is not necessarily uh, making us speechless, but opening our eyes to what is right in front of us and what is the solutions. And one sentence mentioned by um, our speaker in the beginning really um, stuck out to me. It was people outside the Ukraine can fight for sustainable peace by fighting for a fossil fuel world. And that is something that really, you know, summarizes right now where we are at. And um, that is where we are seeing how truthfully looking at what's in front of us, how connecting the dots, how understanding what a real solution and what are the greenwash solution, as well as, you know, Wolfgang talked about what are solutions that pretend to be solutions while actually fueling other crises, while actually counting on something that won't protect anyone um, is important right now, is asked from us right now. So we're seeing how complexity can be freeing, can be supporting. Um, acknowledging and admiring and inhaling the, the dots that we need to connect right now is something that is very much asked from us. Um, secondly, I think what we, we saw all the way through, especially when we came to hope, when we came to urgent action, we're seeing that the categories of impossible and possible aren't really counting anymore. What we heard from the IPCC report um, is, is a word that would you would consider to be impossible when you would hear from it from, from the first time, how would humankind, how would the Western world, how would fossil fuel industries create a world that is so severely harming everything that depends on it? How would that happen? And you would always, you know, if you would hear the story about societies and especially the Western colonialist system have destroyed and harmed um, ecosystem livelihoods and caused inequalities to such an incredible amount, you would always consider it to be impossible. You would think, well, someone would have stopped it. Someone would have stepped up. Someone would have, you know, uh, made sure this wouldn't happen. You would consider the whole scenario that Antonio Guterres, um, you know, has commented on so harshly. You would consider that to be an impossible thing to happen, but it happened. And this means, though, that what is possible now fundamentally changed. And um, it's it's possibly one of the uh, one of the big challenges that's ahead that people are trained to aim for to dream just about what is already considered possible. But we need to drastically extend this frame to think outside of what is considered possible and fight for what is actually not just possible in a in a literal sense, but what is needed, what is what is necessary, what we want, and uh, and what we are working towards. And that is, I think. When we are coming to this complex of crises, of, of the complex of hope, of the question, what drives us in a time where one crisis is crashing over the other, where people affected, um, where people are affected everywhere, uh, where vulnerable communities um, have such a hard time to, to, to restore and um, see that solidarity is something that uh, is lacking in many, many cases. We are seeing, and I think that is maybe on a, on a closing note here, one of the one of the big things to remember that there is an alternative to crisis fatigue. There is an alternative to resignation, and that is not just radical hope. That is not just resistance, but it is also the knowledge that there is something like a crisis muscle, and this crisis muscle it grows. In, in times of crisis, it grows when we are challenged. It grows when we acknowledge that there is a community around us that we can count on, that counts on us, and that is there for us in times of crisis. That grows in solidarity. That, that grows beyond itself when times, times and and crises hit. And this is something that I think you know can very much help us to 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 overcome and to to see through the madness right in front of us. And then finally, of course, we're seeing, and I think all of us speakers made this very clear, this is just the beginning of a time of, 
of people rising up, of radical action, of a radical and, and loving and peaceful fight for equality against, um, against the systems of oppression, against the oppressors themselves, against of what is taking away lives and perspectives. And so um, I am, by, on this note, I, would, uh, uh, I will close it. Tomorrow, um, I'm very happy to. I'm very happy to point on that. We are starting um, with mass peace and climate justice strikes across the globe, um, as a as an answer to a emergency appeal issued by Fridays for Future in Ukraine, in Hamburg, where I am right now. And I'm sorry for the lack of the sound quality. I'm I'm it's a little train station. Tomorrow in Hamburg and in other places across the world, schools will be closed for children and youth to come to the streets. To, to connect the dots between climate justice and peace, which of course is intertwined as ever. And um, this, is, uh, this is where, we, where we're starting from and what we're going from and what we're taking from. And yeah, and for that, I would like to thank all of you for your, for your long attention, for um, all the words that will um, in the chat, um, may, there's just a talk about cap adding captions um, to a video that will be uploaded. Thanks for all the enthusiasm in the chat, all the open eyes and the open minds and the open hearts here, which we so desperately and necessarily need in these times. And thanks, of course, to all, everyone behind this, everyone organizing this, and uh, yeah, everyone contributing and spreading the word about what's at stake and most importantly, what we're going to do about this. Thank you, Luisa, uh, and another final round of thank you to all of our speakers for your time, for your power, for your truth, uh, and for all the inspiration. Uh, and we will be sharing recordings and materials uh, very soon with uh, everyone who attended. Uh, thank you again for making the time in your day and have a great rest of your day wherever you are.